Well, I encourage you and invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, as you turn there, I just want to remind you that this evening um, is our new uh, evening service um, with the primary focus on prayer. Um, I was just, just thinking as, as I came up, just of, of the times in which we um, in the past did not have prayer intentionally in our service and how much it, it, it is a gift where uh, the pastors rotate throughout the month, preparing throughout the week and, and praying for you. So I, I pray you find that as a blessing. And I pray also that you see the need for prayer in the local church. And so as we have been convicted by that, um, that's why we see the need for a prayer service. Um, you've probably heard different details. There will be other opportunities. We, Lord willing, will soon be supporting missionaries. And as they come to the States, it'll be opportunity for them to give updates and reports. And, and also there are gifted brothers among us who desire to preach the word. It will be an opportunity for them to preach brief expositions. And we're going to challenge them on the term brief uh, in that. But if you are available, I would love to see you there tonight. Uh, five o'clock, we'll do a potluck. Because um, what else should you do when everyone's sick but share food together? Um, and then at six o'clock, we'll begin our, our service um, in really just a focused time of prayer. So I just want to remind you of that. Uh, but again, grab your Bible, open it to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, when we begin by opening up our Bibles, it reminds us that we gather for thus saith the Lord, uh, not thus saith any pastor or preacher. And this morning, as you already probably understand, as we turn to Ephesians 6, we're returning to our study in the book of Ephesians. And it's important that we remember the context of what we have been learning in this letter. In fact, just back in chapter 5, Paul was calling the believers in verse 18 to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, he was giving a contrast between a Spirit-filled life and a worldly life. And in verse 21, he gives us the, really the thematic focus of, of where the rest of the book is going. In verse 21, he says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this was the apostles' specific outline for spirit-filled Christians. Paul was giving them the theme for the rest of his letter and the instruction for us in how we are to conduct ourselves in particular relationships. And so he began by starting with the relationship of husbands and wives. And the reason that Paul does this is because the family is the most important and foundational building block of society. A society will either be successful or it will fail, dependent upon how they view and treat the home. Now, understand in this, this is not because man created marriages and families to be this way. No, in fact, we know from looking around us in secular society that man has made quite a mess of this relationship, and this home. And so this is why, even back in the early church, why Paul outlined a biblical view of how God has designed and directed marriage. That really, as spirit-filled Christians, we may faithfully and obediently follow God's direction and design. And so this was the focus back in chapter 5. And now as we begin our time in chapter 6, Paul is going to further instruct us regarding the family. In fact, this is why I continue to remind you that while chapter and verse are helpful, they're only about 500 years old. Uh, the Apostle Paul doesn't say, chapter 6, verse 1, turn with me here. These are for our help in the study of God's word, in the memory of God's word, but they are not infallible. And so Paul's continuing in the same point in which he has been communicating. And so this morning, 
as we look at chapter 6, we learn that he's going to address the children. Uh, Parents, I will say, if there's probably ever a sermon where it should be okay for us to have a little volume from our children, it's, it's this one. Because Paul is actually addressing them in the very first verse of the chapter. And so kids in the room, this, this exposition, more than any other, is directed at you. That's an incredible thing. And so the Apostle Paul is going to give us specific instructions and commands from the scriptures for how the relationship between parent and child is to be structured according to God's design. And so this is what we're going to learn in our outline as we go to Ephesians 6, that children must obey their parents, honoring them as God commands, and also fathers must instruct them. And so we're going to read in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 1. So hear the word of the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And may God bless the reading of his word. Now, as we begin to examine this text, it's important that the source of our parenting comes from the Bible. Now, I think all of us would say, obviously, but I think we do tend to have different ideas and views of how the home is to be structured, what methods of discipline to use with our children, what kind of routines, what kind of schedules. And so I want you to understand this sermon is not about my methods and my views. It's really important that you know that. In fact, I don't even think that would be contextually appropriate considering I have two younger boys and to those with older children, it it would be different applications in certain areas if the exposition was dependent upon my own experiences and my own views. And, And so in that, this is not a sermon on David's 10 tips for better teenage years. It's not an exposition on five ways to treat your toddler's terrible twos. No, I think those would be unhelpful, in fact. They they are often the types of sermons that get preached on relationships and parenting. But I think this exposition is more helpful, not at all because of me, but because our focus today is on God's instruction and his commands to children and parents. See, church, God has shaped and wired the family to reflect him and not him to reflect us. We need to understand that order. In fact, Joel Beakey says in his book on family worship, the majestic triune God did not model himself after our families. Rather, he modeled the earthly concept of family after himself. And so it's no wonder that even when it takes on different looks and routines and, or, or traditions, the family is to reflect the character and the truth of God and God alone. See, Paul has this in mind as he speaks to both the children and the parents here in chapter 6. And so the very first verse of our text, Paul speaks to children. Uh, both the young and old in this room. This verse is directed at you. Paul states very simply in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now see, one of the things that is so subtle in this, but profoundly important about this command, is its context and its audience. See, the Apostle Paul expected... He had a right assumption that children, both young and old, would be present on the Lord's Day assembly in the early church. In fact, his letter would have been read aloud for the entire church to hear. So in that, he could confidently address children here in verse 1. And so believing parents would gather to worship the Lord and their children would be with them. Now, 
I, I think some of us may say, well, that's obvious. And some of us may say, well, that's them. But I think what we need to understand was that there was simply the gathering of the saints. There was no segregation. There was no youth ministry. There was no kids ministry in the early church. Now, understand, age-specific biblical material is wonderful. Uh, I greatly value uh, the catechisms that we can utilize um, the ways in which we can interact with, with children on, on a contextual level. Those things are wonderful, but separate gatherings, groups, and classes which take place, or really take the place of being with the gathered church on the Lord's Day is more often unhealthy and unhelpful. In fact, that's not even in the scriptures or church history. But what we do find again and again is the call for parents to raise their children. And how, as Paul says later, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so really to the New Testament writers, it's an odd idea for children to be segregated. This is the problem today. Many churches would have to shut down the kids program in order for Paul to speak to the children in the gathering of the saints. Now, I want you to understand, Paul isn't being passive. He's being very intentional with the children. And so the opposite of glorified church daycare is not nothing. We do need to do something for the children, especially if we're going to be intentional to get the word in their lives. But here, we need to understand that children are present in the gathering of God's people. In fact, if you study church history, you find that they were taught to grow up in the ministry of the word. They were to learn to sing and pray and worship the Lord alongside their parents. In fact, one of my favorite biographies about a family is John Wesley's family. In fact, he started the Methodist movement based on the methods of studying scripture in their family worship. That's an incredible thing. But really we need to understand it's only until recent years that the church has in some circles decided to send their children off to another place during corporate worship. And honestly, I don't believe that we are better for that practice. I actually think the effects have been devastating and damning for families. And we see that many ch children today are leaving the church when they grow into adulthood. And part of that is because they were not truly raised in the church. They were sent into some other room. And so it maybe got into their heads, but nothing took place in the home to get at their hearts. But see, Paul, when writing to the church in Ephesus, addresses the children directly. And he says, children... Obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, boys and girls, I want you to understand, it is so very important for you to be here. It is important for you to learn to worship the Lord, to sing and to pray and to listen to his word preached. Now here's what I understand. It may be difficult to follow everything that is said. And sometimes it might even be hard for you to focus for such a long time. I know us preachers are long-winded. We ask much of you. Amen. But it's important for you to try. This time is important for you. And as you try to listen, as you try to understand the things that are being said, you will grow. You will mature. See, in fact, it's a wonderful blessing that your parents make it a priority for you to be here. You may not see it that way, but did you know that you are specifically blessed in that way? God has blessed you by giving you parents who got up early this morning to try and get you here on time. That is a blessing to you, even when you don't feel like it is. And so God has richly blessed you in that. And so in that blessing, do your best to listen.
to pay attention to the pastoral prayers, to the preaching of the word. When, when we're called to worship, even to the close of the benediction, listen to God's word and be attentive to it. And, and really, I want to encourage you, and I mean this to all of the kids. Parents, you're left out of this. All of the children in the room, ask the pastor's questions. Now understand, we're not more clever than your parents. Several of your parents are much more clever than I am. Don't tell them I said that, but they are. But again, ask the pastors of the churches questions. If you, if you hear something you don't understand, go to your parent. Say, say, come with me to ask one of the pastors, what does it mean that you said this, that, that you prayed this? Seek to learn from the Lord's Day gathering. Again, our, our prayer and our hope as the pastors of this church, I, I would say even for the members, is that Lord willing, one day you would make a profession of faith. Our hope is that you would come to say that you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Because when you truly confess that, then it's a day of celebration where you'll be baptized in the waters and invited to take the Lord's Supper together with the church. Now see, until that day, parents, I am praying that you would strive to raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. May you model for your children a life that is submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And understand, Paul just gave us an example of how parents are to do that. And so if you are a wife, may your children see your submission and your respect to their father as a model of how the church submits to Christ. And if you're a husband, may your children see your love and your care for their mother as a model of how Christ has loved the church. Now again, back to you children. Remember here that Paul is speaking to you. Don't forget that. He's saying you are to honor and obey your parents. That's what the scripture says. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, I'm going to help you from my own Greek studies, what the word obey means. In the original language, the word means obey. There's never going to be a way around it. Paul is saying, obey your parents. And no matter what translation we use or, or language we translate that into, it means to obey. It means to be submissive to your parents' authority in your life. And so when it comes to your attitude toward your parents, the Bible calls you to obey them. And so I'm, I'm going to challenge you, do not give in to the temptation to disrespect or to disobey your parents. You are to obey them even when you don't feel like it. As Proverbs 6 verse 20 instructs, My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Do not overlook or ignore that instruction. Because children, you are to obey your parents. When you think they are being unfair or unreasonable, and even when you think you're right and they are wrong. Now in that, I think we need to understand as a church, there may be times where a child cannot obey. Specifically for a believing child, if their parent is in sin and demanding that they obey or honor something that is sin, the child is not able to obey, but must obey the Lord. This is why Paul specifically says, obey your parents in the Lord. How would you obey the Lord? How would you honor the Lord? Now, now do that with your parents. See, that phrase, in the Lord, is very important. And so parents, we should... Notice that Paul assumes these children hearing this are being raised in the Lord. Paul rightly assumes that. 
He assumes they're being taught the foundations of the faith and that the gospel is being proclaimed in the home. Now, here's what I want you to understand, parents. We are not making the assumption that they're automatically in Christ. In fact, quite plainly, the scriptures teach us that they are in Adam apart from Christ. According to Romans 5, even as Jaron prayed in his pastoral prayer, someone is either in Adam or they are in Christ. And in Adam all die, in Christ all may live. And so we're not making the assumption that if a child grows up in a Christian home, they're a Christian. No, in fact, we need to understand they are born not into the covenant of grace, but the broken covenant of works. And so this actually means that we have to be diligent to proclaim the gospel to our children. We need to teach the faith to them and pray for true repentance and a credible profession. Simply put, as Paul says, we must raise them in the Lord. And so parents, our desire and our expectation should be that they would believe upon Christ. That they will repent and come into covenant relationship with Christ. And so again, that doesn't cause us or it should not cause us to be ignorant or passive toward, towards our children. Oh, you'll just believe one day. I'll just take you to a few services We'll just watch some of my favorite sermons and you'll just believe one day. We shouldn't assume that, but we should expect that if we are rightly proclaiming the gospel and continuing to invest in our children, that the Lord would bless that. But again, even when they have not or they will not, we are still to raise our children in the Lord. And so we must teach them that honoring their parents is ultimately a way of honoring the Lord. See, children, it is a very important thing for you to obey your parents and honor them. Because when you obey your parents, you're really seeking to obey God. And so this means that God is really the one who has commanded that you honor and obey your parents. In fact, in the following verses of our text, Paul roots his instructions in the commands of God. In verse 2, Paul directly quotes the Old Testament saying, honor your father and mother. And he adds this note. He says, this is the first commandment with a promise. Now Paul is repeating what the Lord has given to his people as a moral guide. So again, we learn here that this is God's design and outline for the family. It's not Paul's brand new instruction. No, in fact, the apostle is simply echoing God's design and outline for the family. In fact, as Nehemiah Cox once said, the best interpreter of the Old Testament is the, is the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And, and so this is not some new idea. This is the apostle Paul showing the church what applies today. Now, specifically, Paul is quoting the fifth commandment back in Exodus chapter 20. And I think this should remind us, church, that we don't need new methods and tricks. We need ancient truths already given by God in his word. See, when we look around at our society, and not just secular, but the whole society, when we look at churches and the state, and we look at schools, both public and private, and we look at the home, in many ways, things are a scary mess. That truly is the reality. Our, our society, in many ways, seems to be headed towards self-destruction. And it seems to even be self-inflicted. But honestly, at the same time, there is hope. In fact, I think we need to be reminded that what we see today is not, in fact, new. It's old issues. It's old heresies. It's old sins, repainted, readdressed, repackaged, and brought back up. And so we shouldn't be shocked, but we should be prepared. I think even one of the most con concerning things that has constantly confronted the church throughout the ages is when men and women, even in the church, want to rewrite or redefine 
the moral standard. That is often a terrible issue. And in it, we see the removal of God's authority in home and in life. And so again, when it comes to being a people set apart in the midst of a crooked and evil generation, we do not need new methods and tricks. We need ancient truths already given by God in his word. Again, here in our text, we find that Paul is rooting the application for young children and parents in God's moral law. And so he writes, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now again, there are two places, in fact, that we find this in the Old Testament. The first, in Paul's direct quotation, is of Exodus 20, verse 12. This is when God gave Israel the Ten Commandments that he spoke to Moses. And he said, honor your father and your mother, in verse 12 of Exodus 20, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then again, later in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in verse 16, when Moses is writing down the Ten Commandments to remind the people of God to live according to his standard. He says in verse 16, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Now, you may notice in both of those passages that there's a promise. Paul told us in the second half of verse 2 and in verse 3, when he writes, this is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, I think this really gets at the heart of the issue because many children can begrudgingly obey. They can, they can follow through in a task but a call to honor a parent really gets at the heart. Both in the Old Testament and in the New, honor is an issue that cuts to the heart. And it either reveals a promise or a problem. See, when a child seems to obey tasks and commands, but they actually do not honor their parents and how they speak and how they respond, it greatly will even affect their life. And, and the reason is because they're being opposed to the parental authority. In fact, in my studies, it was interesting to find that many psychologists found in the physical realm that children who were uh, being opposed or in rebellion against their parents faced all sorts of problems in their life. And one of the thing they, things they all said was their life was much shorter. I think God's authority and word stands over that. We can't outlive what God decrees and we can't make for ourselves our own decisions, our own authority. And so again, the, the promise here is an outcome of obedience, which is the blessing of life. And, and likewise, what's interesting that we find in the scriptures is that disobedience to parents often actually brings about God's judgment. In fact, what's fascinating is that when you read Romans 1, and you look at God's judgment on unbelieving people. In verse 30, disobeying parents is part, or disobedient children who are disobeying their parents is really a result of God's judgment on them. We find this even in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. It's the characterizing of those who are unbelieving and under the judgment of God. Even Proverbs 30, verse 17 says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Very encouraging verse for disobedient children. <clears throat> but here's what I want you to understand. Honoring our father and our mother is a very serious thing to God. 
And the scriptures teach us that honor is an issue that exposes our heart's condition. And so we need to be reminded, both parents and children, the heart of the issue is the issue of the heart. Parents, do you know that apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, your child is a rebel against God? That is the reality. And so if you're struggling with their obedience, remember that the issue is deeper than their behavior. It's so fascinating when you often talk with uh, not just unbelievers, but certain immature believers, and they think their child is just cute and innocent. And yeah, on the outside, that may be absolutely true. But the reality of Scripture teaches us that if, if our child is not in Christ, then they are a rebel against God. They're working in opposite of honoring mother and father. Now, by God's common grace, there may be moments where they seem to obey and do all right, but really, this exposes the fact that every child who is not in Christ is in Adam. They're continuing to work against God's desire and design. And so church, we need to understand when, when Paul calls children to honor their father and their mother, and, and really that there is a promise given in this, we need to understand that this verse should not be applied to our children as a means of them becoming saved. We need to understand that because we can't teach our children that God saves those who honor their parents or obey them rightly. No, we need to teach our children that no one can earn salvation through the keeping of the law. And yet the law is good. It shows us our need for a savior. It shows us how God uses it to drive sinners to faith in Christ. I mean, truly, parents, if there is a time where you have opportunity to explain to your child that they are commanded by God to honor you, and they feel the weight of that, and they realize, I can't obey you rightly, you were just set up to present the gospel. Because the law has exposed that they cannot honor you rightly apart from life in Christ. Again, I think this is the new covenant context in which we need to teach these commandments to our children. And so parents, this means we need to know and love the gospel. When our child realizes the issue of living in law, when they realize they're a rebel against a holy God, we have opportunity to proclaim the gospel in their lives. But again, that means we have to know the gospel. We have to love the gospel. As Spurgeon once said, train a child in the way that they should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. Again, understand these applications are so important for us to understand in order to seek to help our children apply them. Because unless we desire for our children to always live under the law, we need to teach them that ultimately, obedience and honor are things that only the Christian can rightly and freely do. And so we need to teach our children that when God saves rebels like us, he gives us a heart that is filled with life and joy, which is then pleased to rightly honor and obey in the Lord. I mean, really, church, if our children are rebels against God and they are in Adam, why would we demand of them to act like Christians if they have not repented and believed? Brothers and sisters, our children need to be shown why they will not find life in the law. And so again, when they fail to obey or they fail to respect or they fail to honor, acknowledge the sin, uh, address that disobedience, and then proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to their souls. See, again, only the Christian's obedience leads to heavenly life. 
Only the Christian sees that promise in the most wonderful and true fulfillment. And so Paul has in mind here the blessings that come to believing children when they honor their father and their mother. When he says that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now I think there's two sides to this. There's the now and the not yet. And now, right now, this should remind us of how we are to live on earth as citizens of a different kingdom. But again, also, when there's the not yet, ultimately, the fifth commandment quoted here by Paul has a typological promise. Because for Christians in the new covenant, we are not ultimately hoping for a long life in a physical land. We are not national Israel. And so for us, the land is not a physical land on earth that God had given to his people then. But for us, it is eternal life. For all those who repent and believe upon Christ, the land of which we hope for is really a land of the heavenly. And so when someone repents and believes and is regenerated, it really comes to the full reality when we stand before our great king. And so we look forward to that. As the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 10, it was by faith that Abraham was looking forward to the city, that heavenly land that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Now again, I want you to understand, Paul is not teaching salvation based on works. He's not teaching if you perfectly obey and honor your parents, then you will reach the heavenly land. That obedience equals eternal life. No, again, we need to be reminded that, that this has to be understood in the context of gospel. Because true obedience is evidence that one actually knows God. And it results in receiving then the blessings from God. And so children, that's how you will be able to rightly honor and obey your parents and have long life. Believe upon Jesus Christ and trust in him alone. See, ultimately, the promise stated here by Paul is not about how long you live on earth. But that true honor as unto the Lord means you are living in Christ and you have eternal life in him. And so as we honor our fathers and our mothers as unto the Lord, we should hope for the promise that by faith, as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews eleven sixteen, we desire a better country and that is a heavenly one. See, even in obedience to parents, there is a looking forward to what is to come. That really our obedience to our parents should be pointed forward to the Lord and what he desires in obedience and honor. And so again, ultimately, our children will only be able to obey and honor us if they are being raised in the Lord to know him and to love him. And so this is why Paul then focuses on the parents in verse four. He says in verse four of our text, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, Paul's instruction is directed to fathers. And really, I think he is communicating the headship of the home, that this instruction is first to fathers, but it certainly does not exclude mothers from the instruction and the command to, be, to really be part of bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In fact, the apostle is simply showing that, if, that, that fathers need to lead their homes. Because if fathers don't lead, then that will leave a deficit in the home. Fathers, do you understand that you play a vital role in your child's development and spiritual health? I think it is both sad and sobering when we consider how many children are fatherless. And so this is a very real issue within our society. 
many are many children are raised in homes where the father is either partially absent or entirely absent. Either he has gone out from the home and you do not know him, or he is there and you still do not know him. Even when we look at our society, we see how detrimental this is to the home. In fact, one study showed that fatherless homes account for 63% of youth suicides. 90% of homeless and runaway youths. 75% of adolescent adolescent patients in substance abuse centers and 75% of assault. And so understand, statistics don't drive us. Scripture does. But the reality of our culture is that a society that rejects God's design and desire for the home will be headed for destruction. And so we need to understand, again, statistics don't drive us. The scriptures do. And so look at what the scriptures say. In verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Men, to say Paul is speaking to us it feels just like a ridiculous understatement. This is a verse we are not suggested to follow. We are commanded to follow. And if we choose to ignore it, we are in sin. This is so serious. And so he's telling us not to do what is right to us or or to do the things that we know will provoke our children, but to really focus on how to bring them up in the way of the Lord. Paul says it this way in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Fathers, do you have more, uh, do you have discouraged children at home? Could that be your doing? Again, I think sometimes what comes out of our mouths is taken into the minds and the hearts of our children more than we may even realize. And so rather than doing those things, Paul says we are to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. See, again, church, God's design and desire is that children would be carefully raised by both the mother and the father. And that fathers would be faithful to lead within the home, raising their children in the Lord. Now, particularly speaking, I think every father will likely ask the question in their mind, how do I do that? And I think the problem is we make it more difficult than it needs to be. Because the simple answer is it starts with the word of God in our homes. In fact, as an example, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll look at verse 4 through 7, and here we find God's outline and answer for how to raise children. In verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Now let me tell you, this is one of the reasons we believe family worship is such a critical part of a family's weekly routine. Because in it, we are starting each day or, or, or going each day to God's word. We are teaching our children to love the Lord our God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. And so dads, if you want to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, it simply begins with the word of God daily. It's really centered around and focused on and it's driven by the word of the living God. 
It's really where you're reading and reflecting and responding and singing and praying the word. Now again, if we just take Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 as an example. And you take every section of that with your kids. You begin, you, you read, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, that's pretty easy to start with. And so you, you read that passage to your kids and you reflect on it with them. Who is the Lord? What does it mean that he is our God? What does it mean that the Lord is one? You right there have the opportunity to proclaim to them the gospel. To explain who the triune God of the scriptures is. And then in that we respond. We teach our children to apply the truth to their life through, through catechisms and supplemental materials. And then we sing the word through hymns and spiritual songs that really speak the word. And then we close in prayer with them, thanking the Lord for our time and for our family. Now again, here's what's incredible about this routine when families devote themselves to this. What does that reflect well, in family worship, again, the idea historically is that you're reading and reflecting and responding and singing and praying the word of God. And so it reflects the liturgy of the local church, of the gathered church. And what does the liturgy of the local church really reflect and point us to? The redemptive work of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Do you hear how important the gospel is in the lives of your children. See church. If we want to see our kids. Grow up and live godly lives. And come to Christ. And live in him alone. Then parents we've got to get around them. And get in front of them. And teach them these truths. Again. I, I truly believe that it is God alone. Who saves. It is God who chooses. It is the Son who has secured and the Spirit who applies. I believe that wholeheartedly from the Scriptures. But we are called, as Paul tells us here, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. How many times have you read or heard stories of wicked men whose mothers will not give up praying for them? Again, I remember being married for three months and going to a marriage conference and sitting with couples, couples twice my wife's and my age. And, and I remember the discussion around the table of what everyone does. And it got to me and I, I explained I was a, a youth pastor. And, and at the time, uh, I just knew nothing. I feel that today. Uh, but in that time, I remember... Uh, a gal saying, oh, you're a pastor. Uh, my, here's how wicked my son is. Here's how terrible his life is. He's 20 something. Uh, and, and I don't know what to do. What, what book should I get? What, what, what resource should I grab? I was just learning expository preaching. So I just said, the Bible seems like a great place to start. Um, and, and I said, but you know, too, your, your son, while the relationship may shift, because he's out of the home and he's an adult, you don't stop praying for him. Again, I think the greatest battles we can fight for our adult children is on our knees before the Lord. And, and that was just profound to this woman. Where did you grab that? Well, I grabbed that from my own parents, who the one thing we were not allowed to interrupt in, in any part of the day was when mom and dad were doing devotions and praying. That modeled for us what needed to take place. And so parents, I, I'm not trying to say this to scare you, but if you're unwilling to disciple your children and raise them in the Lord, someone else will be willing to disciple them. And there is no guarantee that that discipleship is biblical. Everyone makes disciples. Even atheists try to make disciples. And so if you're not discipling your children the world will gladly receive them. And so, brothers and sisters, your child needs the gospel. They need discipleship from mom and dad. That is not the church's job. 
to teach the truths of scripture to your child. That is not our primary job. We are to support you in that primary job. So yes, we should take opportunities to gather children during the week and, 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 and be in what we could call youth group, but where we're looking at the scriptures with young children, all of which are wonderful things for the church to do. But that does not make the local church responsible primarily to be the one to raise your children in the Lord. We are to support you in that. And so moms and dads, disciple your children. Raise them in the way of the Lord. I will tell you, I am incredibly grateful for those of you who disciple your families. That is a blessing. Those of you who teach family worship to your kids, who've raised them in the instruction and the principle and the commands of the Lord, did you know that that is even a rich blessing to the church? It is. For you to disciple your children means you are not only caring for your own child, but you are caring for the local church. And children, I, I pray that you are very grateful for your parents. There are children with unbelieving parents who do not honor the Lord, who this morning are teaching their children that the greatest thing they can do on the Lord's day is sleep in. You are blessed to be here. It may not feel fun. I'm not very fun. I will admit that. But you are blessed to have parents who love the Lord, who desire to raise you in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. And so my prayer is that you would obey and honor them, even on tough weeks. Because again, you are truly blessed if you have a parent who is seeking to discipline and instruct you in the Lord. And so this morning, church, as we come to a close and we look at the application for both children's and, uh, children and parents, the question I think we must ask from the text is, are we seeking to obey God's desire and design? And specifically for the home, are we seeking to obey God's desire and design? Now, are we each going to have maybe different traditions and different practices throughout the week? Yes. Is every child different? Yes. But again, we must get our understanding for how to disciple our children, how to raise them in the way of the Lord from the Lord. And so are we seeking to obey God's desire and design for the home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for this morning. Lord, we pray and ask that as we go out from here, that you would help us to apply these truths in our hearts. God, I just lift up all of those as well who could not be here, who are sick or who are out of town. Lord, may they seek to be faithful to you in all that they do. Lord, help us to uh, disciple our children in the way of the Lord. God, we know that uh, this year particularly and the year prior have been very difficult. Um, in many ways, there are many families who have gone through different hardships. And so, Lord, we, we just pray and ask that, that you would... Guide us in our homes. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that continues to support and to care for the home being designed according to your word. Lord, would you strengthen the families here? Lord, may, may we come beside one another and, and seek to continue to point one another to your word that we would honor you in all these things. God, again, we give you great thanks and we praise you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.